Welcome to our Facebook Live friends. You all probably know and love Mr. Frank McKinney, the real estate rock czar. And uh, this is our revolutionary growth, revolutionary health, all sorts of revolutions involved with reinvention. And uh, first of all, thank you so much for, for coming. For those of you who are live now, Frank and came and spoke at our center at Palm Partners, Palm Healthcare. And the reason why we wanted to have this conversation as well is to really discuss success strategies for reinvention. And you've, your story is incredible, and I'm sure you'll be able to weave it within here. Uh, but we are coming from one of your reinventions right now, your micro mansion. Um, so I don't know where you would like to begin, but if you were to share what has been your journey and some of the lessons you've learned that would help others, what would you start with? Uh, we can just jump in right with that word, you know, reinvention. Yeah. Um, derived, I assume, from revolution, right? We, we all have to have these kind of personal revolutions that can become quite evolutionary, mm -hmm. right? If you, you only have a chance to kind of remake yourself unless you're schizophrenic a couple times in life. Right. And I didn't intend using this place as an example. So for, for my professional life, we had built large houses on speculation on the ocean. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did. And since the Roman era, there, not me, but there have been the desire to have, the ultra wealthy, to have big houses. Right. And since for the last 25 years, that's what we did until we realized there was a shift. You can become complacent, you can become in denial that there's been a big shift where the ultra wealthy now are not wanting houses as big as they used to. So we took the opulence, the grandeur, the artistry, the beauty, shrunk it down into a more manageable size. That was a he I've built bedrooms bigger than this house. I can imagine. 4,100 square feet is the biggest bedroom I ever built. This is 4,087, so it's 13 square feet smaller than the bedroom I built. But part of the beauty of reinvention is a re reigniting of, of the soul. Yeah. After you've done something for so long, be it work at recovery, come out, come out of your, your program and walk out the door and hope to never come back again, you've, you can't leave, you'll never leave the same person than when you came in the door for the first time, but you could definitely come back the same person if you don't go through that reinvention. Right, and I know when we, you came and spoke today, one of the things you talked about and is so true is that people don't change, they do evolve which is change, and I know what you meant, the, the distinction, but that's what we're reinventing different parts of us, right, in different contexts, right? I mean, you're, yeah. you shared today also being in your health, reinventing. You never started out as a runner, and then right. you became an ultra marathon runner, which is, I mean, you're a go big, go, go home kind of person. So obviously, you're not just gonna do a you know, 5K, you just went for, I mean, how did you do that, actually? As I, I never even asked this. Did you just decide you're going to do an ultra marathon the first time? I think the ultra marathon is a really good metaphor for what your the topic is today. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to be into running to to relate to this story. Of course, an ultra marathon is a race that if of any distance longer than a traditional marathon. So it could be a 50k race, which is 31.1 miles. A traditional marathon is 26. Mm -hmm. So there's your ultra. It could be 50k. It could be 100k. It could be 50 miles all the way on up, all the way on up. Keeps going. When I had this opportunity lay itself on my heart to participate in, or to even fathom participating in this Badwater Ultra Marathon, which according to the National Geographic, it's not my claim, it's their claim, it's the toughest foot race in the world. It's 135 miles nonstop through the Death Valley Desert in July where the daytime temperatures are 125. The pavement temperature, because you're running on a road, is over 200 degrees. Matter of fact, we saw a German crew stick one of those things, you check your turkey temperature in at Thanksgiving. And it went right into it. It went into it and it came out at 206. <sighs> you could fry an egg on it. I've seen people fry an egg on it. So, you know, I, I learned about this race. I had it, had it insurmountable, incomprehensible, impossible, lay itself on my heart. I had two choices, to believe that it was those three things, but others had done it. So, so I hired a coach mm. and I'm not a really good coach person, coachable person, but I knew that if I was going to get to the start line, let alone the finish line, because you have to be invited to this race, invitation right. only, it's 100 people invited, this year there'll be 25 countries represented in those 100 people, oh, wow. that's how international the field is, I needed a coach to get my resume built so I could apply 
It's like applying to Harvard or Yale. It's yeah. really hard to get into. I did, and one of the things she taught me, because I just thought, I mean, think about it, 135 miles in that heat for that distance, yes, you're running. On purpose. On purpose. <laughs> you're not running away from somebody. Right. You're moving, constantly moving. A, a, a good mantra is relentless forward motion. Yep. I'm always moving forward. Even if I'm peeing, I'm moving forward. I'm eating, I'm moving forward. She, I, I just still couldn't put my arms around her. She says, Frank, do you think you could run 135 miles through Death Valley? Do you think you could run 135 miles through Death Valley? The answer is no. I mean, I guess somebody's done, but no. Could you run one mile? One mile. And do that 135 times. So in reinvention, in something as significant as this metaphor called bad water, if I, when I broke it up mm. into something really small, so the race itself, there's six checkpoints. Mile 17, mile 42, mile 72, mile 90, mile 122, and mile 131. I race six different races. Wow. Sometimes I'll wear a different pair of shoes. I'll change my clothes. At mile 90, I put pajamas on. Back that up. Mile 72, I put pajamas on. Why? Because I'm a day into the race. So I, uh, I kind of tricked my mind into yeah, thinking, just, yeah. it's over. The day's over. I put pajamas on for like a half an hour. I lay down. I'm like, okay, okay, okay time to go. That's the way you kind of, if you break down anything significant like that into smaller pieces, it becomes doable. I mean, I mean when we use the term, how to eat an elephant, right, one bite at a time, sounds like a cute metaphor, but you just broke it down in a way that, yeah, 135 one-mile races? One-mile race, one, one mile at a time. And there are actually mile markers. Now, if I count the mile markers, I'll go insane, right? Mm -hmm. I'm so I'm down 135, 134, 133. <laughs> And I'm statistical and analytical as it is. That's why I take my watch off. I can't be, you know, I look at the sun to gauge my time. But, you know, in, in, in recovery or for people who have gone through recovery, you know, the, I, I think the easiest part is the, is the time that you're in the facility. The hardest part is getting in the door for the first yep. day, right? And then what you do on the day one through infinity after you've left there. Well, that's why obviously why the, they say things like one day at a time. You yeah. Take each moment at, at, as you can. You shared something also interesting strategically, like one of the things we talk about are the three pillars of transformation, right? State, like the state that you're in, your emotional state. So I'm gonna hallucinate that in order, and I, I use that word you know, humorously on this level too, because you shared that you had experienced some during the race, but I guess when I use that word, it's also projecting. I'm gonna guess that state management was key in everything that you've done, like to build, to, when you shared your story from starting with 50 bucks in your pocket to buying your first property to getting sharing when you liquidated and started over again would also relate to the bad water and mm -hmm. everything is how do you manage your state strategically? What are some things that you've done to be sure that you are congruent in being in the state to take those each step, each bite? When of you the say elephant? state, you mean like state of mind? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Well, one of the things I shared today was creating my own reality. Right. I think that's really important. I mean, we, we have reality forced upon us in so many ways, shapes, and forms. Yeah. Television, technology. I work from a treehouse. You know, I, I've written five books in four genres, all from the treehouse. The house you see here was designed in the treehouse. I don't like to be surrounded or distracted, I should say, by periphery. Right. You know, and that's really important. It doesn't, you don't have to be artistic to, you know, get having to have a space where you're free from that distraction. Mm. That has always kept me in, in kind of, well, since I built the treehouse uh, 15 years ago. You know, I hadn't written a book until I built that treehouse, and I've written five since. Wow. So it, I think that the, the learning, the lesson for me was, yeah, I built it. I created a space that drew out my creativity, my ingenuity. And, and I think everybody needs that kind of space, you know. But you didn't have the space, the treehouse, when you were running. So how did you manage your state for, for that? And I heard you say mantra, like... Yeah, relentless forward motion. Uh, here's the other thing that I, and, and this is more of a biblical thing, but you know, there's a season for everything in life. If you mm -hmm. read Ecclesiastes, it talks about the season for laughter, the season for sadness, the season for joy, the season for all, it goes all through the seasons. When I'm in that race, Doug, it is a metaphor for life. There is extreme highs, euphoric highs, and then 10 miles later, I could be bawling my eyes out because I got, I feel like, you know what, and I've got another 70 miles to go and I've already got blisters on the bottom of my feet. Wow. You know, so what I've learned though is with faith, patience, and the passage of time, those low points pass. Unfortunately, <laughs> so do the high points, right? Right. 
And as long as I can endure, like last year in my race, I, I, I've run this race 10 times. I've, I've finished it seven times. But what most people don't know is I failed three times in a row. 12, 13, I skipped 14 or 15. I failed three times in a row. Am I aging out? I'm getting too old. Last year, I'm back again, trying again. And one thing I didn't allow it to happen last year, I don't even know if I can articulate it, I wanted to quit so many times, and I had all my meltdowns and problems and issues, but I never let my mind cross over. Like it wanted to, and it was ready to, and I'd take my shoes off and throw my glasses down, but I never made that crossover. So maybe for somebody who's gone through recovery, you know, you've crossed over, you, you're, you're sober now, don't ever allow your mind to cross back over. Remember that amount analogy I gave this morning about you know, Schwarzenegger holding your head underwater? Yeah. Like how bad do you want to breathe? Right. And if you want to breathe bad enough, you'll push Schwarzenegger's arm off, off your head and you'll breathe. You'll find a way. You'll find, and I think, I think staying sober and, and, and being, you know, being righteous with your life is, can be the same way as breathing. Well, absolutely. Yeah, one of the things we talk about a lot is killing the monster while it's little. And that's essentially what you were sharing, what I see is by not letting it cross over. That's letting the monster get bigger. It's pulling the weeds before they take the garden. That's when you were, so hard to do, but you, that's a good one. Like, I've never been through a recovery. I, I wish I had a program like yours, you know, when I was a teenager, but they didn't have it. Uh, that is really important because today things can grow out of hand real quick. Everything's going quicker. Yeah. So much faster. So when you apply all of those things outside of running, I'm sure when you made the decision to build this, that was a huge change versus what you were used to, and you're taking a risk because it's new. This is a reinvention of a, a, a way to provide a beautiful place to live and, and meet the needs of your clientele who have a particular thing. How do you manage even building and making the decision before you, uh, you I'm sure had monsters in your head, the little internal dialogue going, eh, I don't know about that. Yeah. And, I'm gonna also guess that people from the outside, maybe some people who you trust or whatever, like, dude, I don't know. Right. How do you still push through knowing that you have that inside that could still grow? How do you maintain the, the weed pulling? You know, I guess you, you gotta consider the source. I'll never forget, we built this $30 million house on spec. This one isn't 30, this is you know three and a half. But we built this $30 million spec, and being uneducated can be somewhat intimidating when you're up against somebody who's really educated, even if you've been successful, right. Right? at least for me. I, I have a real, like I was asked to be on a board of governors with a, for a university once, and I, I was so, I was honored, but I was so into like, I'm going to sit on a board of governors. I went and bought a suit, got a haircut, and I walked in like, where's Frank? Like, what, what, what happened to you? Why, why did you do this? We want you the way you are, you know? <laughs> but, uh, but, um, Sorry, question. I got tangent. Uh, about there. killing the monster while it's little with changing, you know, the voice inside your head that may have been telling you, oh, I don't know, who's going to want the... Oh, 30 million. Okay, yeah. sorry. So, 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 so yeah, the source, the source, I was told when we built that house, a guy from MIT was quoted in this article in, in the USA Today saying, there's no market for a $30 million spec house. There's no buyer for it. That, and this is all his MIT education could buy him, that young man, at the time I was younger, will be dumpster diving in a year. Like you couldn't come up with something better than dumpster diving after getting educated at MIT. I'm like, oh my God. Oh, oh my God, he's, what if he's right? I'll be adding out a dumpster. And then, yes, it started going, which pushed me even harder to succeed, not to prove him wrong, but it's like, okay, what if, what if, what if they're right, mm. you know? I just watched the movie Case for Christ. You should go see it. It's like, okay, you know, atheist versus like, uh, Christ. Well, what if, what, if it's, what if it is right? You know, what, what, if, what, if, what if there's Christianity? What if he's right? And I went out and busted even harder, and I ended, up, I ended up selling that house in a relatively short period of time. And I took the article that, that was written about the house, and I remember cutting it out, and I, and I took a picture of me sitting in a dumpster. And I took the picture, <laughs> and I sent it to the dude at MIT. You know, so... The, 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 sh the shorter answer really is, is I, I will always consider the source. 
And it's really important to allow the, the, the little monster, it's okay. Like I want to allow some, I allow some of that in. Mm -hmm. I want the feedback from the marketplace. I've got enough to where we're going to build another one of these and I know what I'll do better, mm -hmm. you know? So, but, but it gets back to that creation of your own, you know, your own reality. And, and, and as, as I said this morning, people that go through recovery or, in, or, or best destined for recovery to enter recovery, they're wired a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. They've got a synapse or two that are different than the rest of us. I think it's a gift. Yeah. I think that the person who enters those doors, they struggle. They can be tortured at times with that gift. But if you can turn that into a true gift, and as I, as I mentioned before, you're not going to change, but redirect into something constructive versus destructive, yeah. you can set the world on fire. I have not changed. I still have the addictive personality that right. I am addicted to excitement, but I found a constructive outlet. And that's the ultimate back to what we shared earlier about the change is the reinvention of energy. Yes. The transmutation. If you're saying, you know what, I have this, let's use it. How can I use this to propel me? Because either way, I, I use the example of a compound bow, mm -hmm. right? So you get to a certain point and you've got all this leverage. And then once you hit a certain point, you've got tons of energy, but then where do you focus it? Right. Where are you going to, are you going to do it to make a difference constructively in your life, in your family's life and blah, blah, Right. that's important. Or are you going to take it down? Either way, you're going. You're going to use the energy. Right. Yes. Um, and then one of the other things which I totally relate to and appreciate it is, is the spiritual higher calling that I believe that without that, this is my personal opinion. It, well, the big book's based on it. I mean, right? Of course. It is based on the whole thing. And what was so powerful about your share today was that alignment that if you can align your professional and spiritual calling oh yeah then it's a game changer it, it's a game changer for not just you but anybody you love anybody you come in contact with because you know when when you're in recovery or out of recovery you're kind of and you should be kind of monomaniacally focused on just that and then you're gonna you're broaden your focus a little bit you got to focus on put money or food on the table and making money your professional highest calling, what you do for a living a little bit better than most, not better than everybody, but a little bit better than most, will come to the forefront, typically to the detriment of your spiritual highest calling because we don't focus on it. It's Doug, I've been there. Yeah. I focused on the professional highest calling until I was in my mid-30s. I was a broken, lifeless soul that had a lot of money and success. Very unhappy, very unfulfilled, until I realized, okay, you know what? You're in the housing business. You're a simpleton. You graduated high school with a 1.8 grade point average. Why don't you provide housing to people who don't have it? Like the pe people buy this house, they don't need another house. They have houses all over the world. Right. But when what we do over in Haiti by building these self-sufficient villages, you know, we built 24 of them in 21 Haitian cities in 14 years, that's my spiritual highest calling. Yeah. And I got to put together what I do for a living, build, build these beautiful houses, with what I do for the less fortunate, building these self-sufficient villages, and, and it reignited my career. Yeah, and your passion. My passion is greater now than it's ever been. And it's contagious, because then what happens when you, it, just my experience watching you and, and others, is that when that alignment is there, it's almost like support comes out of the woodwork, like the universe just aligns to create the opportunities and there's still the struggles, there's still going to be obstacles and there's still all of that. But you, you, from my observation, it seems like you're actually now truly co-creating with God or your higher power, whatever language you want to use to something that's bigger than just you and I, where you can right. own the I am because we are right. and that we're, we're, we're conspiring to make a difference rather than conspiring to, to make a, and negative difference. Make, right, right. Yeah. right. You know, there's, it's a beautiful, you know, one of the things Tony says, our neighbor right down the road here, mm -hmm. up, up the road, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. is, um, is that that conspiring, that spiritual game is business, right? Business is a spiritual game. Mm -hmm. And if you can align it, it's more than rewarding. You know, and I go a step further that, that well, I, I would say that, you know, I, mean, I forget which step it is, but 12 that references God as you, ref, ref, as you understand him, you know, he, he will, it will, in my world it's a, it's, it's a he, mm -hmm. or it could be a she, but it rewards responsible stewards. When you're responsible for the blessings he's given you, 
and, and believe me, come to Haiti with me sometime, you'll feel like the richest person in the world. Yeah. When you're a responsible steward for the blessings God's given you, yes, the universe, he more than conspires. He wants your territory to enlarge yeah. because you're doing good for, in my case, his kingdom. Now, the devil will be around every corner trying to take you down in a way that I can't even begin to explain that, that was very foreign to me before. But knowing that I'm being a responsible steward for the blessings. Listen, if you pray at all, okay, and, and, and whatever you pray to, if you inventory your prayer, you don't have to be on your knees by your bed at night, but inventory what you pray for. We all pray, if you pray. If you don't, you can tune this part out. You pray for some form of more. More love, more peace, more joy, more happiness, more, more money, more resources for us or those we love. I don't have to just be selfish. Of course. But God wants to reward you with the more you pray for. He really and truly does. He just wants to know that you're a responsible steward for the more that you already have. Gratitude. And, and, and that, that is a critical part where we, we wonder, like, why isn't God answering my prayer? Well, what are you doing with what you already got? That's a perfect example. Seek and ye shall find. Yeah. Ask yeah. and ye shall receive. God isn't judging necessarily because when we're angry, what happens? What else, get, what, what else pisses us off when we're angry? Everything. So God is going, oh, you want to be angry? Oh, okay, cool. Here's, Here's more, yeah. More. more. But when we come from a space of gratitude, service, right? Servant leadership, God yeah. goes, oh, you want to add more value? Right. Okay, Here's you want to be grateful? Here's more. That's right. That's absolutely right. And it's a beautiful upward spiral. It really is. I mean, yeah. the, way, the way I've watched it, it's not every day isn't, you know, what do they call it? Uh, something, uh, uh, rainbows and, ho uh, rainbows and unicorns? unicorns. Right. Not every day is that. But I'm grateful for those days too, those those crappy days, because yeah. those are the ones you learn from. And what a shift right there. When you're grateful for things that cause pain. No, nothing else can enter the mind when you're in the moment of gratitude, you know that. You right. can't share gratitude with anger, you can't share gratitude with any other emotion. Nope. So forcing it in there and to say, I'm you know, I'm grateful because I was sneezing, this lady had terrible perfume. Okay, well there's gotta be something that I gotta find grateful. And I, yeah. I try to do that. And as I got is getting a little bit, I'm getting a little bit older. I'm finding that a little bit easier to do. One of the tricks I found with this, and I'll give Tony credit for for that, is uh, when that does happen. If I'm struggling with gratitude, then I just add a little shift of, well, if I could be grateful, yeah, right now, what could I be grateful for? If I wanted to be grateful for <laughs> being able to, yeah. you know, smell that perfume that's right. now making me sneeze. Wow, my <laughs> nose works. Wow, how, how cool is that? Yeah, it's a dumb analogy, but no, not yours, but the perfume. I, no, I guess, yeah, no. <laughs> this, is, this is really good. You're right. No, but but you know, we, we talked this morning about um, that that difference between motivation, inspiration, and aspiration. I yeah. think that's really that's something that is as I look back almost on a post post mortem of my life. I mean, I'm not dead yet, but I can look back and say, wow. Now I know motivation doesn't last, wasn't meant to last. I can't stay motivated to be sober. Can't. Motivation washes off the body and goes down the drain with the soap at night. Right. You can, you, you, can, you can read a motivational quote on Facebook. How long does that last? About three seconds. Right? Squirrel. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it, it doesn't. And the more we see them, the less condition, the more of a condition we are to just disregard them. Exactly. So I can't stay motivated to stay on a diet or go running or all the other stuff. Oh, that's a bummer. But you know what? There's a little bit of a relief to know that we are not, as a species, meant to stay motivated. Inspiration lasts about as bad of a, as bad, as long as a bad sunburn. So you've been sunburned before. They last a week. You peel away, then you're back. So, so you can read an inspirational book. And it'll last for a while. I mean, I've had some that last a while. Or watch an inspirational movie. Eventually, it wears off. Oh, wait, Frank, you're bumming me out. I can't stay motivated. I can't stay inspired. It, then what is it? It's aspiration. When you identify something that's really greater than you can comprehend now. I aspire to blank, which is greater than I can comprehend now. That's actually the third thing. The first thing, who do you aspire to emulate? Yeah. It's such a fun exercise. It can be a fictional character. Can be somebody you look up to. Can be Tony Robbins. Can yeah. be, in you know, my case, Rich DeVos. What legacy do you aspire to leave behind for your family, for Ellie and for Heidi? I mean, that's a question. If you answer that every day of your life, you you may lose motivation or inspiration, but that aspirational endeavor or undertaking will never you'll never lose sight of that. Yeah, yeah. We use that you brought out today is and the purpose. Like why? Yes. You know, that's everything that 
I've been sort of basing my life on and noticing even in right now, let's use the example of politics, right? As polarized as that is, is because the aspiration part, the purpose part is missing. Yeah. Right. People are, are getting too fussy over process. Like how like when you went to even build this house, did it go exactly the way you wanted it? Or did you have some obstacles in the way? Did you have like bad water? Did that go exactly the way you wanted or did you have obstacles? But when you have your aspiration, when you have your purpose, you leave it right you're there. flexible over process, yes. whatever it takes. I, we'll but figure that stays out a way. there every day. Laser focus. It's just yeah, I, I like that word monomaniacal because that you know, so so getting this thing done. Yes, it was late. It was it was it was a couple months late. It was a little over budget. All these things that go along with an imperfect imperfect profession called real is real estate or building or what have you. But but knowing that the 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 desire to create this market micro mansion it's an oxymoron. Those two words together don't even really work. Yeah. But to create <laughs> that was always at the forefront for my wife and myself, and. Contrary to the naysayers, you know, well, well, isn't a micro mansion just a small house? <laughs> that was a great <laughs> one. I saw somebody say, I'm like, not necessarily, because you take the beauty and the grandeur of the opulence and you just shrink it down. You won't find finishes in a house this size anywhere else. Mm. That's the primary difference. So my buyers are used to this kind of finish. Right. They're, I don't have a monopoly on small houses, but I have a monopoly on the finishes that are in this small house. Right. Yeah, and it is gorgeous by the way just to take a, a quick walk around it's amazing just oh, the, the, yeah, the that countertop is insane the the sink in that bathroom yeah. like the and star was, fire glass yeah, yeah was beautiful. that all custom like yeah did you? yeah that that countertop i'll show you when we're done what, what we did to do that it's something else and the other thing which i i do also and i'm blessed and i is what you just shared is it, you shared it today and you just mentioned it now is is your partner yeah. You know, your wife and, and how important the the working together that it's not, you know, behind every strong man is a strong woman. You, it is. It's co-creation. Right and that's the ultimate yeah. trinity, isn't it? It is. God and then your your partner of choice. That, that's the ultimate mastermind. You know, that that's that's probably doesn't relate to everybody. So not everybody's married and all that. But but when you do find a significant other and you're together for as long as, you know, I've been with my wife, it'll be 27 years this year, 30 together. I mean, married 27 that takes a lot of work right and and yeah. you know you when you're for her um you know being married to probably the only functioning functioning multiple personality disorder that she'll ever meet it's pretty hard for her to you know i mean she, she was born to be married to me right you know <laughs> and, and and i in in turn i hope i bring something like that to her but but it's a beautiful in today's throwaway society you know mm -hmm. mary's throwaway society uh to, to, to fight for that, the, just the, the sanctimony of what that represents. I mean, it's not a, it's not a contract I have, you know, mm, it's, it's, a, it's a covenant yeah. with her, you know, and, and, I, and I, I think that everybody should experience that kind of love. Well, I 100% agree, and, and I, I mention it because really, if someone's not in a relationship right now, they either, you know, want to get in one, and that's one of the most important decisions you'll ever make as far as, you know, that kind of intimacy. Or if they want to get out of one, they're going to want to look for one again. Or if they're blessed to be in one to, to really appreciate and acknowledge how important that is. Um, because if you think about it, if, I mean, at the end of the day, isn't that ultimately part of our legacy is sharing that joy with, with somebody else. Somebody That's else. why there's seven and a half billion people on the world or Earth, right? I mean, we yeah. would have died off as a species if love, at the basis of everything, didn't ever exist. If God didn't create that emotion, that singular word, that singular emotion, which is what we really all live for. Yeah. I mean, if you, as, as I said to your group this morning, when I ask a question, you know, like, why do you want to go to the gym? And eventually you keep asking and keep asking. Eventually, I just want to be happy. And then beneath happy is really love. I mean, yeah. it, truly, it truly is if you keep peeling away. And, and that one word, I mean, being in love and living in love and, and having that beautiful word in your life is, 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 is magic. Yeah. And just think of everything that we do do, depending on whatever scale, when you build this, you obviously did it with love and care and attention. And at the same time, you can 
deliver this opulence and have it drive the same energy, the love for all the villages in Haiti. Yeah. And it's probably more rewarding, I'm going to guess, obviously, doing the that. Haiti stuff. But, well, yeah. I mean, it's a different level of rewarding. Like, people say, don't you feel good about going over there? And it's not about hugging orphans or feeling good about myself anymore. It used to be, and I talk about my tap book, The Seven Stages of Feeling the Tap, and, and, and now I'm getting to stage, I oscillate or vacillate between six and seven. But br when I bring people over there who, have been, who are exposed to that for the first time, that life, yeah. And knowing that they made an impact by building a house for a family of eight that were living in a mud shack covered in palm fronds for a roof of rodents running across the floor. You can build a, you know, a house that's about half the size of this room that's concrete for, eight, for four grand. And you know you've taken that family out of that, that mud house who were eating the mud patties I talked about today. The kids are eating the mud patties. You put them in a nice house for them. It's a mansion. And... I mean, just to see the change come over people, because most of these mm. people come on the trips for, I mean, the, you know, the lifestyles of rich and famous. You have to get to have lunch or dinner at my house and hang around with cool people. But when we send around a questionnaire saying, what was the highlight of your trip? It's never visiting Frank's micro mansion or having lunch at his house. Yeah. It's what they did in Haiti. Right. You know, that's... And that's the ultimate... That's the ultimate joy for me. Because then they're paying it forward as well. And then they become ideally disciples James, and they just keep going. And it's, it's wonderful. That, that, that's being a responsible steward. Right. Not just hugging on the orphans, but really turning people on to that whole tapped lifestyle. And ultimately, that, I guess to wrap it up on multiple levels, is that you talked earlier about feeding someone the McDonald's walking by, or you know, it's teaching a man to fish or feeding a fish. Right. So you have the the financial remuneration of, okay, let me teach you how to build a house. Let me teach you how to do that. And then you have the ultimate spiritual remuneration where you're going, let me show you how to make a difference and pay it forward so that you are now teaching someone else how to add value in a way that actually changes the world. Yeah. Which is, I mean, I can't thank you enough for being a leader in that because it's... Well, you know, but I don't want your, your viewers to think, I mean, changing the world, this is a really important thing. I mean, your world. That's what I want to focus on. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, I... But, but how do you define the world, right? The world, when I go over there, how do we define the world as humans? It's not a world of seven and a half billion people. Mm -mm. It has... So it's, people say, Frank, I mean, the, the naysayers. Right. I, I mean, naysayers, I listen to them. I actually... You can't close your ears to them because they're all over the place. When I hear them say, oh, you'll never make a difference over there. I know you want to change the world, but you'll never do it. Well, I, I already have. Because if you were living in one of these houses as a family, and I, I provided you with not only that house, but the, the renewable food, the clean drinking water, the free enterprise, the schooling, the clinics, you know, the micro lending, the church, all this stuff for you to go and live your life, I have changed the world. Yeah. Because the world is perceived as you perceive it as an individual, not as a mass. Right. So I can say, yeah, man, I changed the world. Shut up, naysayer. I changed the world. I changed it one, like your perception of the world, one person at a time. And, it's, and, and for a while, Doug, I didn't get that. I used to come back from Haiti, and I would not want to go out to dinner for like a, forever. How could I uh. go to a restaurant and pay 20 bucks for a hamburger when they're eating dirt? Oh, I lived in, I really suffered. I mean, I don't want to say suffered, like emotionally, like, how, oh my God, how can I do this? Until my mentor said, Frank, well, I forget the saying, maybe you know it better than I, be careful not to weaken the strong while you're strengthening the weak. Mm. And I was trying to strengthen the weak, and it was, it was weakening the strong because it was just pulling all of my life energy out of it. Right. I was like, how can I go out to dinner? No, you, Frank, you get out to that restaurant tonight, and you buy the filet mignon. I mean, you need to stay strong because they, they need you. Well, and that's such an interesting dichotomy that we run ourselves into, that guilt for doing well, for, for succeeding and having these things. And it's interesting, I was just... The other day, there's this uh, documentary called Minimalists. Have you seen or heard of it? And it was so interesting. And basically, the people were like, basically gave up everything and were, and that was cool. That, you know, if that's what you're into, that's wonderful. And they were kind of attacking a little bit people who were successful yeah, to yeah. some degree. And then, you know, Heidi looks over to me and goes, God's not a minimalist, God's abundant. Yeah. Mother Nature is abundant. What? How are we, how is that helping anybody right. by not showing how amazing life can be? Yeah. 
You know, you don't see the acorns, you know, the, 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 the tree, the coconut trees out here complaining about the coconuts they make because, oh no, that other coconut tree doesn't have as many as we do. Right. But by leading by example, now we're lighting the way. And isn't that ultimately, I mean, again, to get a little biblical, isn't that what Christ yeah, said? It's true. But down in South Florida, it's because of the keeping up with the Joneses. It's, it's tough. I mean, this is mostly South Florida people. Yeah. It isn't easy to exist down here. I mean, it's not. It's not easy to, to, to you know, date. It's not easy to succeed because somebody's going to be more successful than you. But I, I have a, you know, I have a simple approach to what you just referenced about what Christ would want. The thing with about religion that turns people off is the dogma. Right. So it's kind of like my dogma ate your karma. <laughs> <laughs> my karma ran over your dogma, right? <laughs> <laughs> but if Christ were to be here today, now the first thing when I say that, people think sandals, robe, dirt, beard, disciples 2,000 years ago, unrelatable, but he wouldn't. I mean, he would have a colorful shirt, he'd have gr blue shoelaces and Superman socks and carry an iPhone. And so if he were, were dressed like that, I just kind of want to be like he would probably be if he were here today. Not preaching by a well or all this shit. I mean, he would come and he'd go to the homeless shelters and he'd do it. That's all. I mean, Jesus was skin today. Up. He would he show did. up and he would relate. He'd get on his iPhone. He'd have issues, but he would still try to to to, to connect right. to people. And South Florida is not an easy place to do because not not everybody feels bad about being you know has this guilt thing about being success. They they're happy to flaunt it, but they're not happy like no. you shared earlier. No, they're, they're not happy not inside. Be, right. Mm -mm. And and ultimately, that's that's the goal is to be okay with you know let your freak flag fly. And, and, you know, and again, in, in the Bible, not to be overly, you know, dogmatic, but second only to love is money referenced in the Bible. Right. It's referenced a tremendous number of times. And so God wants you to be wealthy. He just wants you to be a responsible steward for the wealth. That's all. That's... Which isn't easy. <laughs> it's not easy because we're consumers and we're materialistic. Back in the biblical times, we couldn't go, we can buy a new donkey. <laughs> You know, we ain't going to buy a new Ferrari. I mean, walk yeah. around, you know, your donkey looked pretty much like my donkey. You might have a newer donkey with a newer saddle. Actually, didn't even have saddles. Yeah, so right. the They're... consumeristic and materialistic things didn't exist. And forget Jesus' times. It didn't exist 100 years ago. Well, yeah, you had just had the classes. That classes. Was, that was it. You, you were either in one or the other. Ultra yeah. or, or not. And it's amazing how if we just can really get back to aligning aspiration, spiritual center, and really taking all of those into consideration, we can quiet the monster inside and add value and be okay with whatever we're doing and not be judging. That's a thing. Really, when someone's judging someone else, it's, we know this, it's just saying more about their insecurity than right. anything else. Um, so thank you for leading by example by making such a huge difference and, and sharing today. Um, I don't know how long we were going to go or if we screwed you guys up, but... Uh, not at all. I thank you. Any final words for anyone here? Uh, you know, I would I would say that you um, make sure you take risks in life. You know, most people that experience fear, that fear is associated with the thought of taking a risk, yeah. not the actual taking of the risk. <laughs> the thought of it. The thought. So yeah. if you've bungee jumped or jumped out of a plane, it's the fear of jumping out of the plane. Once you jump, the euphoria sets in. It's over. So there's, I mean, the the one, two, two chapters of my first book that are really, uh, that really resonate is exercise your risk tolerance, your risk threshold, like a muscle. Yep. Eventually it becomes stronger mm -hmm. and you can withstand greater pressure. The problem with most is that when we think about risking, we become fearful. When we become fearful, we don't right. do it. We stop. But if you think about risk in the terms of, risk is almost always associated with a big change. Mm -hmm or a big challenge in your life. It could be financial, relational, spiritual, dietary, blah, 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 go on and on. And so I'm thinking about a big change or big challenge. I need to take a risk. Fear sets in and I stop. Mm. We, we don't even take the big change or the, go pursue the big change or the big challenge. And then we're sitting on that rocking chair, you know, on our, on our porch at 80 and saying, gosh darn it, you know, I should have. We're going to regret, right? Let's yeah. regret what we did, not what we didn't do. So I am afraid every day of my life. 
but I use that fear as, a, as, a, as an indicator, as a blinking little light that says, Frank, you're about to ready to take on a big change or big challenge. So don't let that fear, that, that risk, and, so, and the other four letter word associated with it, stop you. And that's something that, you know, in recovery or out of recovery, you've got to embrace risk. And, and make sure that as you go through that process called life, you know, that you're able to dovetail that spiritual and the professional highest calling. That makes for a lot of hopping over happiness and landing on joy. And we know what happens to happiness and the difference between it and, and joy is pretty right. significant. And the other thing is, if you, ha if you haven't, you need to buy this house. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, throw the right, plug. We got it. <laughs> we, we've got a $3.4 million. If you can afford it, give Doug a call. He'll, yeah. We'll pay him the commission. There you go. Are you financing it? No, but you could. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Awesome. So thank you so much. Thank you, Frank. You are a star. We so appreciate you. And uh, I love you for who you are and who you aren't. Have an extraordinary day.